Welcome to Beyond BIM. I'm sure many of you, when you think about Beyond BIM and the technologies that really push technicians in their day-to-day -day jobs, inevitably fall upon design automation. Automation with BIM has become increasingly more accessible due to visual programming tools such as Dynamo and Grasshopper. In today's episode, I have the pleasure of speaking with Marcelo Scambelluri on the state of computational design and automation with BIM. Marcelo has worked on many BIM projects over the last 20 years as a project manager, design engineer, and BIM director. Most notably, in his early career, he was inspired by the likes of Frank Wright, alongside whom he also worked with. This inevitably led him down the path of pursuing computational design and BIM automation with real intent. Marcelo is also internationally recognized as one of the top BIM leaders and contributors to the education and implementation of BIM technology within the building industry. And if that wasn't enough, Marcelo continuously speaks at Autodesk University and the Revit Technology Conference Built, where he has also received first place speaker award for a record of 16 times. And now let's hear more about computational design and all things Dynamo from Marcelo himself. Thanks ever so much, Marcelo, for uh, joining us on Beyond BIM. You have been known in the industry for quite some time when it comes to the topic of dynamo and computational design in particular with BIM. Can you tell me a little bit more about yourself and what led you to your career path into the world of BIM and also computational design in the first place? Sure, uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, yes, it's, uh, well, uh, it was, I've, I've been in the industry now 22 years, uh, so it's been a while. Uh, when I first got into the industry, uh, I was, uh, my formal training is uh, structural engineering. Uh, and so I started working for a structural engineering firm, actually, I'm still with them now. Uh, in downtown Los Angeles, we were working on some very complicated structure uh, at the time and uh, with, uh, with the architect, Frank Geary. And so uh, at the time, <laughs> at the time we had to, uh, uh, make sure that we conveyed everything uh, through 3D models because we just couldn't do it through through classic uh, drawings and specifications. So I had to learn quickly how to model in three dimensions, how to express forms in three dimensions, uh, how to be able to work with um, architects and, and uh, acoustical engineers and, and all that uh, in the 3D world rather quickly, rather early. Uh, and so that just kind of put me on the path to 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 continue to work on projects that were uh, that were uh, more uh, non-conventional, less uh, rectilinear in shape, uh, more complicated shapes, also ones that needed to be uh, expressed in the computers. Uh, then shortly thereafter, uh, Revit came on the scene uh, and hit our industry pretty hard. Uh, so it was a rather easy transition for me to move into into that as more and more workflows became uh, three-dimensional and expressed. Uh, through, through digital communication, really. Uh, and then so I was kind of naturally fell into the role of being the, uh, the BIM manager and then the BIM director, uh, as well as working with our clients to help them, uh, help work with them in the 3D world. So, so that's just kind of the natural progression I go through. And then anytime a new technology is out, I just, kind of, I just kind of move into that realm, learn it, and then help apply it to, to the company, but as well as, as, the, as, well as the industry. So, uh, so computational design was just kind of another natural step to get into to help uh, to help in this whole in this whole BIM process, uh, and um, and then uh, you know so so anyway that's just kind of been my philosophy is, is I'll just kind of take on a new technology uh, I'll try to learn it and then apply it practically and try to explain it explain it to the industry and and I, and I believe you've probably you've been you've seen some of my classes so I think that's where I probably get the most exposure. Uh, uh, but that's, yeah. that's kind of how that's just kind of how it is and you know it's 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 ongoing so i mean i'm constantly working on new things to to implement study and and, um, and teach and apply you mentioned something there that i didn't know that you had worked with frank gary and i can imagine that had been quite inspirational given that he obviously has been renowned for the use of 
computational tools with design. And I guess that must have been kind of the thing that spurred you on into, into that area. Uh, it actually, it was, yes. Uh, it was, it got me very interested. I, I got to meet uh, quite often at their office in, uh, in Playa del Rey. I got to see all the physical models that they were building as well as, mm -hmm. as, well as how they would mathematically define that in the three-dimensional models. Uh, as well as how they would rationalize it for for uh, documentation as well as fabrication uh, and so so a lot of the things that, that, that they were doing really interest me uh, and so it kind of uh, it inspired me to um, to kind of continue to think about about in that way and and early on we were, the, the 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 construction the AEC industry didn't really have a good software to to communicate things in three dimensions so uh, when uh, Frank Gehry's office was looking at this, so the way I understand it was they had to go to the airline industry and use a software called CATIA to help them um, model and express these forms just because the, the AEC industry wasn't quite up to, to the uh, same uh, level as the, the airline industry was in terms of expressing kind of free form geometry. Uh, and so all my early training, um, uh, well, not training, I kind of trained myself on it, but all my early 3D modeling uh, and documentation was done in Katia. So when I moved wow. to when I moved into Revit, I had a very three-dimensional Katia way of looking at it, and I think that's probably why I started to see how far I could push Revit to its limits and try to model animal shapes and and cows and elephants and things like that, just to just to see how far I could actually push it. And it was it was a good idea because uh, it really showed the industry what was possible uh, inside of inside of Revit and, and, and other software. And so fast forward to today, now you're also a solid advocate of Dynamo and Grasshopper for Revit and have given many talks on this topic. So for those that may be new to some of these tools still, can you give an overview of the power of these tools and why they are so important for modern day technicians or designers? Uh, that's a good question. Um, why they're so important? Uh, okay. Uh, well, what what is what has what has happened was um, it, so I got to back up a little. So in our industry, uh, for a very long time, uh, the software that we were using, uh, we 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 really had to be um, uh, we really had to kind of work with what we had available in terms of uh, the software and the user interface and where where things were and, and how they were all set up. Uh, I think with the with AutoCAD there were there were uh, teams making like list routines and things and, and uh, to, to make things a little more automated. Uh, but uh, when when Revit came on the scene, uh, it really didn't have that initially. Uh, but there was a big cry to have the ability to customize and automate Revit. Uh, and so uh, the AB, the API was was born out of Revit. Um, this was still a little bit before my time before I started using it, but. But uh, that allowed that allowed text programming to modify Revit to make it to to customize it and to do repetitive tasks, you know, whatever it may be. Um, it was still a bit cumbersome because uh, you had to know uh, text coding, uh, which was still a very um, uh, thing that was kind of reserved for developers and, and people who were extremely familiar with it. Not the not the average architect or engineer. Uh, what happened with computational design uh, is that um, visual programming was was born out of that, uh, which allowed just about anybody in the architecture and in, uh, engineering um, uh, design discipline to to uh, be able to uh, perform those same tasks using the Revit API, but not having to know text coding. You basically needed to know how to put down boxes and wires. It was a very easy way to step into to code, uh, and uh, it it just came it just naturally came with so the dyn on the Dynamo side it naturally came with Revit, uh, on the on the Grasshopper on the Rhinoceros side it, it uh, Grasshopper naturally came with Rhinoceros. So these programs were easily available, easy to use, and and um, and once people realized how practical they were, they kind of grew like wildfire. So so the the benefit of them is that you have the ability to automate things, be able to customize. Uh, in a very easy and efficient way. And of course, the other thing is that, of course, a lot of people now in the sector are incentivized to learn how to code as a result of 
using these tools that you mentioned. And for those that are still trying to learn how to manage with Dynamo or Grasshopper, you've also published a cheat sheet that was recently made available online. Where could some of our listeners get a hold of that if they were interested to basically improve upon those skills? Oh, okay. Yeah, you're talking about the recent book I put out. Um, yeah, it's called the, the Dynamo and Grasshopper Cheat Sheet Reference Manual. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, the website is uh, aeccheatsheets.com. You can go there and, and, uh, and get the book. It's, it's across the world now. Uh, I partnered with some, some to get it all across the world. So aeccheatsheets.com. Yeah, the, the idea was there was just to extend the, the ability. With, the idea with the book was that I wanted to get uh, people uh, exposed to the software, but in a very easy and non-intimidating way. I think uh, what what the progression of of these computational design tools were was that when they first started early on, um, they were really only used for very complicated projects, uh, and so um, I think the initial reaction to them was that it's not applicable to me. I don't do those very complicated projects. Uh, it's also very difficult to learn. Uh, and so I wanted to, I wanted to kind of um, erase that uh, kind of stigma that's on there. And so uh, the book, uh, the way it's formatted is, it's just these easy one-page summaries, uh, just a few, uh, with hundreds of examples, but simple concepts uh, that aren't intimidating, that are practical, that can be used basically on just about any project. That's fantastic. I'm sure there's a lot of people that need a quick reference guide to continue learning. Um, so now if we go back into the world of architecture and computational design, how would you say it's evolved or changed since you first started using these tools and what is the current latest state of the art? What's uh, the possibility of the tools now? Possibility. That's a good question. Uh, well, I touched on it just a little about kind of the evolution of it. When it first came out, it was really for not that it was really for that, but if that's where its immediate application was, was on very complicated projects. I remember seeing some demos on Dynamo. Uh, well, I've been using Dynamo just about since the, the time it started. Uh, I started using it in 2013, although mm -hmm. I think I, I'm, not, I'm not the best historian on Dynamo, but it has been out a few years earlier than that. But I was one of the first early adopters of it. Uh, uh, Grasshopper for me came on much later, uh, so I couldn't speak to the history of that or much of its early development, unfortunately. But I could talk about uh, Dynamo in relation to, to Revit and um, when it first came out, original application was all those complicated projects. Uh, and so, uh, um, and at the time, uh, it was really just a raw manifestation of the Revit API. So a lot of it was uh, a lot of the um, a lot of the naming of, of the functions and things like the the, the actual the nodes uh, were were consistent with the Revit API, uh, but the Revit API and its kind of functionality is not necessarily the same as the Revit user interface. So so when when Dynamo first came out, a lot of things were were uh, were a bit confusing to the common Revit user. So. Uh, if you wanted to change the type of a family, I'm just, you know, for example, it was called symbol. And, yeah. you know, symbol in the Revit API means something different than someone who's using the Revit user interface. Uh, and so, so it was, uh, the nomenclature was a bit confusing for a while uh, until uh, a lot of that stuff got sorted out. And now, now it's actually, through its evolution, uh, it, has, it, has, it has changed to be more in line with the Revit user interface. But that, I think, is, is, is uh, that um, basically is something that happened with our industry in, in, in most software uh, is that, um, is that uh, early on uh, when things were developed for the API of a particular program in ADC like, like Revit or, or whatever, um, the, I think the idea was that it was made for de by developers for developers. But, but, but now as we look into the, into the if we take a snapshot of the industry now, these tools could be used by just about anyone in the AEC industry. Uh, and so um, it's no longer just for developers. Uh, and so we're starting to see a change in how even APIs are used, uh, how, they're, how they're structured and how they're named. 
so that it could be more for the common user, less for developers. And that is that is extremely exciting because it, it allows it allows uh, more and more people to get involved with it. Uh, um, uh, and so, um, so just to build up on that, if I'm thinking about the future, um, it's the future is all about um, being able to customize a tool that you have, uh, and then being able to um, being able to uh, uh, scale it uh, and have it usable by other people, as well as have it used within other programs. So, kind of the latest greatest things that are coming out um, are the new Rhino inside Revit technology that allows. Uh, rhinoceros to talk with with Revit through through Grasshopper being kind of the the, the visual programming conduit. Uh, it'll it's allowing uh, Grasshopper and Dynamo to talk together. Um, also, uh, there's there's other tools out there. Uh, there's other tools out there that, that are starting to allow software to communicate with each other. Uh, and um, some of the new things that are also coming out are um, even things that go above and beyond um, just using it between uh, soft software. So uh, there's a new uh, uh, a new uh, technology out there called Rhinoceros Compute, which allows you to actually place uh, a functionality, 3D modeling functionality on the web. Uh, okay. And so I think the future looks at at things that are more accessible, but also things that are uh, that are allow more repetition. Uh, and then so that's where you start talking about generative design. Uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and more uh, uh, like more uh, uh, repetitive design tasks. So it's yeah. a very exciting time. Uh, one other thing too that 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 I think will will encompass all of this that we're doing is the advancement of all the new game engine technology. Uh, so the ability to visualize a lot of this stuff uh, using the game engine technologies is um, is a big help. So if I'm, I'm thinking about a little bit in the future, it's going to involve uh, it's going to involve uh, APIs that are that are more uh, tailored towards the everyday uh, uh, AEC professional. I see uh, game engine technology being a part of, of what we're doing for visualization. I also see a, a, a iterative design, generative design, uh, as well as as well as well uh, applications talking to each other. And one more, uh, and uh, accessibility, uh, which would be like web applications, things like that. Because not everybody will have the software um, that you want to share your information. So. So it's a it's 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 a uh, anyway it's it's part of that trying to solve that whole issue. So it's an exciting time to be in our industry. A lot of exciting things are going to be coming down the pipe here. It definitely is. And I have another question. Maybe this is a more contentious one, but this is one that I was uh, discussing at least with one of my previous guests, Bill Allen. So my question is: Should architects and technicians know how to code as a result of this? stepping stone that we find ourselves in with Dynamo and some of the other tools, is this a skill that some of the technicians should really begin to perhaps embrace or also add to their existing knowledge? Um, well, uh, <laughs> well, um, I don't know if that's a contentious question, but um, <laughs> well, okay. So um, I think, well, my immediate reaction to that is if someone knows how to code, if someone's an AEC professional and they know how to code, it definitely will not hurt them. Uh, just because of everything I explained, the snapshot of the industry now, and and the way it is in the future. Uh, I think what you're more asking is, 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 is it absolutely necessary? No, I don't think it's absolutely necessary uh, that you need to know how to code. I think what you need to, at the very bare minimum need to do, if you're an AEC professional, is to know about the code and know and know that these type of functionalities are available. So uh, you know, I think it's less of an issue if someone needs to know how to code if they're if they're either just coming right out of a university or um, or they're already intimately involved with with these uh, with computational design. I'm thinking of some maybe some of the ones who who haven't done this in the past. Are we saying you know maybe who? An architect or engineer who's been working in the industry for 20 or 30 years who's never coded in their life you know are we going to say to them you turn around and you learn how to code uh, you know maybe they're already a manager they're less in production you know th those kind of questions come up right uh, my answer to that is no not necessarily i think the only thing you need to do is be aware of what's available you need to know what the word dynamo means you need to know what the word generative design means you need to know uh, be, you need to know um what 
what the word grasshopper is, what, what visual programming is, what, what an API means. Because, because what's happened in our industry is everyone you work with now are familiar with these terms. And they're going to be talking in those way in, in regards to that, in terms of kind of this um, high, high tech language, I should say. Mm -hmm. uh, so you may go to a meeting and, and, uh, and uh, they say, well, we, we laid it all out in grasshopper um, uh, you know, that sort of thing. And then, you know, the thing you wouldn't want to happen with, with an AEC professional is to say, wait, what, what's that? We don't use that, you know, that sort of thing. So, so to be familiar with these terms at the very least, I think is, I think is important. And mm -hmm. then I think the co the coding would be a, uh, maybe let's say would be a, a prerogative of yours if you wanted to do it or not. Although I would, I mean, I would recommend it, but I'm not saying it, 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 it you know, has to happen. Okay. Uh, it's easier, and it's easier now to code only because things are getting, excuse me, things are getting way easier. Uh, and there's a big industry that 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 supports a lot of these programs. So if you wanted to learn Python, you could just easily Google it, uh, or if you wanted to learn uh, C sharp, or you wanted to learn about the, the API, you can easily Google it and, and just get your get your feet wet with it. And I guess in a similar vein, it also links back to education and making sure that those students that do graduate are also aware of some of these terms and technologies and stay up to date with the fast paced technology. The, the thing here is that it is very fast paced. A lot of the tools will change very quickly and become redundant or out of date. How do you suppose educators can stay on top of these changes and ensure that the students remain flexible enough to perhaps learn those skills? Uh, that's a good question. Um, these are all good questions. I probably should stop saying that. <laughs> uh, uh, whoa, okay. Well, um, yeah, I know you're in academics as well. Um, I actually, I, I, I quite enjoy academics. I, 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 I like to keep a pulse on it um, and where it's at in our industry. Um, I also guest lecture at, at USC twice a year mm -hmm. um, and talk with students and professors. And so um, I think I think it's an integral part of our industry. First of all, that absolutely is necessary. Um, if the question you're kind of asking is how do how do how do institutions keep their students relevant as they graduate? I think probably there's two things I I could see as um, as being extremely beneficial. One is getting a good snapshot of the industry and what's really out there versus what you may learn theoretically in the classroom. So uh, inviting practicing AEC professionals into the classroom or maybe giving a seminar on, okay, this is this is this new technology you're learning or you're learning rhinoceros, you're learning grasshopper uh, in your, I don't know, in your studio class. Uh, let me explain how really this works in the industry. Okay, we really don't use that, but we really use this, uh, you know, and, yeah. And this is the kind of terms that we use, and this is what we think is important. Uh, and so I think that's extremely um, helpful uh, for professors and students to hear like what is being practiced in the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, I think another thing uh, too is um, is uh, it is it is hard to, especially I, I kind of know a little bit about how hard it is to to um, uh, to keep up so quickly with with all the uh, industry changes and getting them actually as like formal classes. And, you know, you couldn't just, you can't just flip the switch and, 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 and add a new class uh, you yeah. know, every semester on, on the latest tech. So, I mean, I, I completely, I completely uh, under, understand that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, um, I think, I think just another thing is just keeping, keeping, um, keeping students aware that, that, um, that uh, they may need to remain flexible as they as they go out. The thing that they that they're it's, I think more importantly is the mindset that you learn uh, in the classroom. That's important. What kind of mindset mm -hmm. do I need to get into to solve this problem? Because I may not be using this tool. I may be using that tool. So what's the mindset? So I think I think keeping students relevant would be kind of understanding what's in the industry and making sure they're kind of in the right mindset and the right attitude as they move forward. And, and, and then also, uh, you know, not get discouraged because uh, it, it's not, um, you know, finding, finding the job that, that um, you know, find the job that, that you may, that you want is not always the easiest thing. So yeah. probably 
words of encouragement along those lines as well. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And then I think we'll just briefly touch upon the use of these tools again. And that is mainly just from what you've seen so far, what are some of the biggest um, challenges that computational design can simplify and make life a lot easier? So what are some of the more practical uses if you were trying to let's say sell this to an educator or a new graduate what are the types of solutions and problems that could be solved with these tools i'm sure there are infinite amount but perhaps ones right. that you there think are, are <laughs> there are infinite amounts um uh okay on the on the on the surface the the immediate the immediate use cases for for these computational design tools are basically the, abil the, uh, the ability to uh, automate. Uh, and, and, and there's a lot of tasks that are done inside of BIM software or the software we use in the AEC industry that's extremely repetitive and boring, quite honestly. And, and you, can burn a, you can spend a lot of time uh, if you were only using the, re the interface to do these tasks, maybe, I don't know, uh, change, change, change the sheet number yeah. Uh, 500 sheets, you know, you just, you just start doing it one at a time, you know, um, but, but these tools allow you to automate, uh, which, which really can save you a lot of time. Um, and you could focus your efforts on other uh, very, um, uh, maybe more meaningful tasks. Uh, so that's one. Two uh, is you have the ability to customize and, and what, what software has done just because this is how they have to do it is they make a user interface that is 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 more towards what they think the common or most um, or the most users would want to use and and they they cater that towards their workflow but you may have you may work in an office that doesn't use that workflow you know maybe maybe you do this then this then this well that's the way you have to navigate through the user interface but if you have the ability to customize and use these types of uh, tools you can make those workflows yourself and you can tailor it to your specific workflow and your company. Um, that's another extremely powerful thing um, yeah. uh, for, for, the, for the industry and someone having knowledge of coming, coming, out, of, coming out of the you know, educational system. That's great. And I think automation is the first thing, but then when I discuss or see this discussed in industry, a lot of the times there's also, I don't know whether this is used as an excuse, but there's an element of fear where people might feel intimidated that, okay, if we automate all these tasks, what's really left for me as a technician? And perhaps maybe this is something you've encountered as well. Ah, that's a good question. You know, if, if, uh, <laughs> if this software can make all my door schedules, and that's all I ever did was made door schedules day in and day out. Then what what relevance do I have, right? Is is yeah. uh, is is a it's a it's a very good question. Um, I <laughs> I have experienced. I, okay, <laughs> it's a good question, uh, Erica. Uh, well, I think I think there's a few things there. One is um, is I think as as you evaluate yourself and what talents you have. If you truly, if, if every talent you have, this is just my personal opinion, if every talent you had that you could contribute to your industry could be done by making a program and replicating what you do, well, then you may need to evaluate what else you may need to learn and what other new skills you may need to learn. Because certain things cannot be automated, you know, uh, like judgments on, you know, like, engineering judgment, architectural judgment, uh, you know, uh, uh, code interpretation, you know, um, 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 uh, management, um, uh, uh, document, uh, like, uh, specification authoring. I mean, you know, there's all these things that can't be automated. So I think my, my immediate reaction to all that is yes, we just live in a world where things can be automated. Um, yeah. And, and so you, so as you understand what's getting automated, just reevaluate where you are and what you, you know, and what you may need to know if you want to continue to be in that, in the, in the industry. And, you know, I mean, it's, it happens all over, uh, even, even in structural engineering, uh, 
you know, um, you could design a, a composite steel beam, uh, you know, and there's programs now that can that can do that. So if that's all you ever did, well, then, you know, you may need to. Go. So, so, you know, you, <laughs> you know, it's just, I think, I think I'll just leave it there because I, yeah. I have a pile of examples I could go through, but it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a very good question and it's never going away. And, and I think other industries have already had to deal with this. Uh, mm -hmm. It just happens to be our industry now is doing it. But I mean, I, I think I think of it this way. I mean, you know, you you just because you have a tool doesn't mean that your 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 job's going to be irrelevant. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. the fact that you have um, like just the fact that you have like Word on your uh, you know like a, a Word on your computer doesn't mean that um, you know it's going to write for you. Yeah, it's going to write for you. Or you're, you know, you're, it doesn't need your good authoring skills. You know, so it's just mm -hmm. these are just tools that I think. I think this is the best way I'm going to say it uh, because because Dynamo uh, does this too, is you know instead of becoming enemies with the software and the automation and the technology in our industry, we need to become friends with it and you need to learn how to work with it and have it help augment what you're doing because if you if you think about it as always being um, a disruptor in terms of your professional career then you're always going to feel that way because there's always going to be disruption and the technology is always going to get better and better. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, just be friends with it, not enemies. I think that's kind yeah. of my statement on that. That's a good one. I think um, perhaps another one, and this is more about the challenges that you encounter with some of these design tools. So maybe from your perspective, what are the areas of improvement that you foresee? What are the challenges that you think are still there that are not resolved? Um, some of the challenges that are not resolved uh, in our industry that deals with computational design and, and kind of technology in our industry. I think, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, there's there's a few. I, 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 I think what, I think some of the challenges are that um, I'm not, Okay, I think some of the challenges are is that one thing we grip we one thing we grapple with in the industry is not everyone wants to be um, uh, uh, forced into using one particular software. So, so we find that there's um, there's industry professionals that, and companies that use different software, but they ultimately need to talk to each other. I think um, this whole issue of interoperability is 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 starting to get solved but we're nowhere near uh where it needs to be and and i think um i think the the what can be improved is the the ability for these types of software to better kind of communicate with themselves in a more open-minded way because uh, a lot of them still like to stick to their particular formats their way of doing things um, but it would be nice to have the ability, it would be nice as we move forward to, to have maybe a more universal format so that, um, so that uh, these, these, these types of um, systems can talk to each other uh, of more, more seamlessly. It's certainly way better than it has been in the past. Yeah. I, I see that's, that's, that's probably one thing. I think another thing too, another challenge that I think uh, we could be, could be solved in our industry is maybe, um, uh, equal emphasis on on um, equal emphasis and realization that the industry now with the AEC professionals have the ability to and will want the ability to use the API and customize and use visual programming tools. But what I what I still see in the industry is in, is that more emphasis is put on the user interface and. And uh, you know that goes through vigorous alpha testing and beta testing, mm -hmm. as opposed to the, the 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 API tools when either they're being developed or they're being tested. They just they don't go through that rigorous um, uh, uh, type of um, uh, testing yeah. that I think it should, and I think there should be heavy emphasis on as well as well because what I still find is that um, APIs uh, functionality. They are they are not as user friendly as they could be, yeah. uh, and so and so I, I would like to see that's a challenge in our industry, and I'd like to see the mindset change mm. uh, on on that. I mean, you could just you could you can see it all over, right? I mean, when you see a new software, 
I mean, what does it say? It says, here are the new features. But when they say new features, quote unquote, those are new features for the user interface. They're not new yeah. features that are available in the, in, the, yeah. in the API and what you could access programmatically. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. So the quality of APIs matters just as much. It matters just as much now. Maybe it didn't mm -hmm. 20 years ago when, when, when it was made by developers for developers, but now it's a, it's it's different. You, you could survey you could survey individuals in a, in an office in an engineering firm or an architecture firm or AEC firm, and ask them how many are actually touching the API of a program. You'd be surprised how many do it. And so it's the mindset has to be different. The user base is bigger, and so I would like to see uh, more uh, development along those lines. You know, even even simple things like you know, does this name make sense? Uh, you know how it's organized is that on and I, I don't quite see that yet in the industry uh, and so I'd like to see that challenge be taken on and, and solved. That makes sense. I think uh, a lot of the listeners who maybe haven't yet started their journey into computational design might want to hear from you how they could perhaps start or begin. Where might they uh, go to find some resources? What would be the smart thing to do to begin that journey? Uh, I think the smart well, if they're already searching, that means they're already, they're probably already made a decision to learn it, which is good. I think, I think, um, well, I, uh, I mean, quite honestly, now this day and age, I think a good Google search would, would serve you well, I think just to get a little snapshot of, of, of what's out there. Now it's really intimidating because there's a lot of information out there. Uh, I think, I think um, getting an understanding of just what it is, right? First of all, that's probably a good Google search. Then I think uh, finding a project, and it doesn't have to be a project at work. It could just be something that you want to apply to. Uh, like, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make a box, uh, whatever it may be, and I want to be able so that it can, I can push and pull it. Okay, so let let that be your task. Now learn how to do that. How are you gonna do that? If you if you're goal focused, it's a lot easier to learn. So if you pick a goal, a task, whether it's at your office or at your home office or whether it's project related or not, whatever. Pick one, get used to what the software does, and then start trying it. Uh, I think as you as you start to apply things, you ask critical questions like, wait, why is it done this way? Okay, what if I do this? Oh, it works the same way. Uh, and then um, and then there's uh, forums out there through all these software that's really good. There's a Dynamo forum and a Grasshopper forum. Uh, uh, and then I think those are good places to start if you're just starting out. Um, and then, uh, of course, there's there's a whole pile of training courses out there on the internet. But you know, I think I think I think, however you however you learn it, I think you need a task, and then you learn. Like for me, I I uh, I learned Python recently, uh, and I thought, what's the I had I need I didn't have a project to to work on. Uh, I mean, I I did, but I wanted a fun one, so I actually I built a Python. Uh, uh, inside of uh, Grasshopper using using Python, <laughs> and that was a lot of fun. Uh, but it was just it just kept me focused on yeah. on, on a task, uh, and then you know you, you feel some sense of accomplishment when you do it, and then you have all that experience behind you with what you've learned to to really tie it all together. That's fantastic. I think that's a great piece of advice because so many of us might start learning something. And then aimlessly we forget about it as we have no actual goal or task that we put it to test to. So finally, for those aspiring designers, technicians that do want to then learn computational design, do you have any last kind of golden piece of advice before they begin that journey? Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, I, I, okay. I, with computational design, um, computational design, I see it uh, as basically a supplement to what you're doing. Um, so you could choose to, to do it or not. Computational design, as we talked about, will automate tasks, um, can, help you, can help you design, um, can help you uh, do generative design. But the, you could do all of that manually inside of all the software that's available now. So Revit or Rhinoceros or or whatever. So you technically don't need it. I'm putting that in quotes. You will save yourself a lot of time and energy uh, and maybe efficiency if you use them. So the way my golden piece of advice is that always look at these tools, computational design tools, as gifts, as, 
presents as extra things that you could use. And if you look at it in that light, then you're going to be less frustrated when things go bad. You know, maybe something crashes and then you got to start everything up again. You know, as you, as you think, well, you know what? I have, I already have the skills to do it manually, but I'm using this extra tool. So that's the way I kind of look at everything. You know, it's kind of like a, someone, I mean, I see it this way, you know, if someone were to hand you a present, uh, you know, and you didn't like the color of the box or the bow, the color of the ribbon, you know, you wouldn't hand it back and say, I wanted, I wanted a blue, a blue packaging, you know, and a, and a gray ribbon, uh, you know, they'd say, fine, I'll just take it back, you know, so, so uh, I think in order, I think the right mindset, the, my suggestion is to have the right mindset, a positive attitude, and to look at these as, as kind of supplements and, and gifts to what you're already doing. Makes sense. And for anyone that's interested to find out more about some of the stuff that you're doing, your work and your presentations, where might they find information on you? Unfortunately, it's kind of spread all around. You know, I probably should be better about getting it in one location. Uh, but uh, I already mentioned the book. You could get that at aeccheatsheets.com. I also run a blog site, Simply Complex. Uh, there I have a podcast as well as a blog site. Uh, and uh, also, um, you could search Autodesk University. I've done, uh, I think, 25 classes there uh, that are all up online. And then uh, also, you could just you can look for me on Twitter or LinkedIn. And finally, a heartfelt thank you to all of our followers who have been with us so far. If you enjoyed this episode, then please follow us on LinkedIn or YouTube. And better yet, share this episode with your friends and colleagues.